Good afternoon. I'm Nurja Shah with the Illinois Chapter, American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar on influenza. This webinar is sponsored by the Illinois and Chicago Department of Public Health. Today, we are joined by Jennifer Burns from the University of Chicago. In accordance with the requirements of the FDA, the audience is advised that the information presented in this continuing education um, activity may contain references to unlabeled or unapproved uses of drugs or devices. Please refer to the FDA approved package insert for each drug and device for full prescribing and utilization information. The course directors, planners, faculty, and reviewers of this activity have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. Evaluations will be sent post-webinar by Rush University with a link to the survey to be completed. Once the survey is complete, you will receive your certificate via email from Rush within a few weeks of completion. If you're going to watch the webinar in a group instead of your own individual link or computer, we will need the group's information immediately after the web webinar in order to add you to the registration list we sent to Rush University, and you'll need to complete the evaluation post-webinar as well. Please send an email if you haven't already to nshah at illinoisaap.com with names, credentials, and a valid email if you are not logging into the webinar from your own personal link or computer. Otherwise, CME and CNE credits will not be awarded. Participant phone lines are muted. This webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions for a speaker during the presentation, please enter them into the question box on your control panel on the right side of your screen, and Ms. Burns will answer them at the end of the presentation. After this webinar, you will receive an email with the link to the recording of today's webinar, as well as a PDF of the PowerPoint slides. Now I'd like to introduce Jennifer Burns. Jennifer Burns is a pediatric nurse practitioner who works in the Department of Pediatric Infectious Disease at the University of Chicago Comer Children's Hospital. During the H1N1 pandemic, she established and directed an immunization program for children of medical center employees that grew to include all family members. The program immunized more than 5,000. Since that program was so successful, it is done annually at the medical center. Jennifer continues her mission by immunizing students, families, faculty, and staff at local schools. She speaks regularly on the behalf of the Illinois chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics on topics related to immunization. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Burns. Hi, this is Jennifer. Can I, you hear me? Okay. Thanks for taking time to talk to me today. And I'm talking about my favorite subject, influenza. Not actually the disease, but the uh, chance that we can give our patients and parents and families vaccines to um, prevent illness. So here we are, full swing, October. Let's get talking. So we do know that every year we have sporadic epidemics and pandemics, excuse me, yearly epidemics and sporadic pandemics. The last pandemic we had was in 2009, and last year we had a mini epidemic with the mismatch of the uh, influenza type that we had for our second A. We do know that our flu viruses, our influenza virus, creates mutations and has new strains, hence we saw that last year and we had... Um, uh, a, a vaccine mismatch and more disease than we had seen um, since pandemic flu. Annually, about 5 to 20 percent of our U.S. population is infected. We have over 200,000 hospitalized annually, 20,000 influenza-related deaths, and over 2,000 deaths in um, 19 to 64 years of age individuals. And what people don't actually always realize is in this hospitalization of 200,000 people annually, um, they're including seizures, encephalitis, different things, and we attribute that to be caused by influenza. Um, who is uh, affected by this? Illnesses can occur in all age groups, but our highest risk populations are our young children, especially our infants um, under a year of age. Elderly patients have the highest de death rates. 
pregnant women, um, they're immunosuppressed, so they can have a 30% morbidity or mortality when they get influenza during pregnancy in any trimester. People with asthma, diabetes, heart disease, neurologic conditions, any kind of chronic um, disease, and individuals who have compromised immune systems, which is increasing more and more now. Vaccination is the only way to really prevent illness. So the impact of influenza, you know, in individuals who are 65 and older have the greatest impact, uh, followed by uh, our young children, um, zero to four years of age. Um, we actually um, analyze the hospitalizations per year. We look at this data through the CDC. And what we found is about 65, let's say 66 persons per 100,000 were hospitalized related to influenza. In deaths, it can range from 8% to 10%. Um, last year, we had a, a peak uh, of about 9.3% in 2014-15 season. Uh, pediatric de deaths range from 34 to 171, and last year we had 145 deaths of our pediatric population. Severe illness can happen in any age group. And the impact on our economy is about 2.3 in direct costs to the medical system annually, and that's not including um, other financial burdens parents and patients have to take on as a result of having influenza with childcare, staying home from missing work, and so forth. And reiterating, vaccination is the best way to prevent complications. Now, you, any one of us can access this um, screen. This is from the CDC. It's a flu view, and it really goes and looks at um, pediatric A influenza deaths per season, and you can actually look and see what serotypes are circulating in different regions. What is this? But this is the bar graph that looks at um, deaths and what the highest week of deaths were. Uh, and so we can look at this. And you have to remember it's counting down by weeks, um, like 52 is the end of the, the calendar year and so forth. And this is available to anybody to look at it. And it's available by region and it's available in, uh, by US data as well. So our vaccine recommendations. So it's a universal recommendation for flu. We are to vaccinate everybody six months of age or older and less contraindicated. Okay, what are the influenza types? We have A, B, and C. Type A causes moderate to severe disease, affects all age group, infects humans and some animals such as pigs and birds. Hence, when you saw H1N1 with swine flu when it first came out, we stopped that because we didn't want the pigs to get in trouble. Um, and as a result, when we did have it swine flu, a lot of countries um, were killing their pigs thinking that they were the cause of it. So we said, no, make this H1N1, uh, and then um, now is how its uh, nomenclature goes forward. Birds, we still are always looking at China and Asia for avian flu, um, and hence it's our bird flu that we're always looking at. Uh, we do have avian flu that is in China, about 600 cases, but there's not been human-to-human -human transmission, and we're always watching for that, because once there's human-to-human -human transmission, we are going to have to prepare for a pandemic. Um, Influenza B is generally milder than A, but primarily affects children and um, adults who have children and only infects humans. And now we have a quadrivalent vaccine, so we always have uh, two A's and two B's, so our B's are covered in our influenza vaccine if you are giving the quadrivalent. And type C is rarely reported to cause illness, and most cases are subclinical, so we really don't ever carry that in our vaccine. So the timing of flu and uh, vaccination, flu season starts in October and goes through May, and typically it's peaked in December through February. And in the last like three to five years, I believe it's been in December to January in the first weeks. Um, it takes two weeks to make antibodies from the vaccine, so that's why it's important to start vaccinating early before people are ex exposed. We'll offer a vaccine as soon as possible by October, the latest if possible. Um, providers, as we should always offer um, routine vaccination during our visits, hospitalizations, sports physicals, school physicals, or like I do, I have a separate flu clinics where it's an injection only clinic, evenings and weekends where I vaccinate the whole, peop uh, whole family. The visit takes about seven minutes. And I vaccinate throughout the entire flu season because what people don't realize is that influenza circulates in other parts of the world all year round. And even in the United States and our southern uh, regions, such as Florida, um, Alabama, Georgia, and so forth, 
influenza circulates all year round. So if we have a person that's traveling, it's really important to immunize. Types of vaccines, a nomenclature changed about two years ago. Instead of TIV for trivalent, now we're saying IIV to indicate inactivated influenza vaccine. We still have <clears throat> two different types of um, serotypes that are um, circulating in terms of trivalent and quadrivalent. And then we had uh, other products that came to market, cell base culture, recombinant, and high dose. These are other options that are typically not available for the pediatric population. Um, the cell base and the recombinant are typically trying to um, be vaccines for people who have um, egg allergies um, and need minimal egg protein in their product. And we'll talk about that later. And then live <clears throat> attenuated influenza vaccine is only quadrivalent, and that's our flu, our brand name known as flu, flu mist. So going forward for updates in 2015-16 season, <clears throat> the ACIP has not given any preferential treatment for either the injection versus the inhaled. So there is no preference for the live attenuated vaccine as there was last year. Uh, uh, versus the inactivated um, influenza vaccine for children 2 to 8 years of age. We have simplified the algorithm for pediatric vaccination. There is a new method of vaccine administration that's actually not available for pediatrics. Um, it's a needle-free uh, free injector site. It's intermuscular for people 18 to 64 years of age. And it's only used for a fluria only. Um, we will see, I'm sure, um, sites want to do pediatric tribal trials on, on this because a fluorary, I believe, is licensed for individuals three years of age and older, but this product with the injector free has not been tested in pediatric patients so far. And flu block, which is the, completely, uh, the flu vaccine that's completely not made with egg, is again only expanded. Um, the age range they're hoping to expand it for persons greater than 18 years of age. Flu zone intradermal vaccine is now available in quadrivalent formula, and that had not been available in the past. But again, flu zone intradermal is for 18 years of age and older. Um, for our pediatric recommendations, uh, it's children six months to eight years of age, they need to have received in um, a flu season prior to July 1st, 2015, greater than two doses of flu vaccines. Um, and then if they've complied with that, then they'll only re be required to receive one dose of vaccine this flu season. If their flu vaccine is, uh, history is unknown, give them two do doses greater than four weeks apart. If they've never received flu vaccine, then it's typical, give them a flu vaccine and then um, four weeks or apart. And again, here's our nice algorithm. I always put this in my patient's room so that I have the parents looking at it and so that we're both on the same page that they do need it. And if you're ever in doubt and you don't know if the patient's had it, I always err on the side of caution and I will um, reboost them because uh, I'd rather have them have the best protection that they can have than have the, the least protection. Um, Age uh, recommendation, ACIP recommendations in terms of LIV. Um, LIV or um, inactivated influenza vaccines can be given to children greater than um, two years of age and no preference again. So we do ask that no children um, who are taking aspirin between two to 17 years of age or aspirin containing products do not get um, uh, <clears throat> influenza vaccine as a result of these individuals don't take aspirin and then association with Rye syndrome, even though that that um, is old, old data, but this is how it was indicated on their FDA license. For individuals who are two to four years of age who have asthma or I most importantly say we've had wheezing in the last year should not receive um, flu mist. Um, consult a medical record for history or asthma or wheezing episode. I, I typically use this question, has the child wheezed in the last year? Um, and so if parents say yes, then I tend to err on the side of giving them the inactivated influenza vaccine. But everything is in a risk-benefit ratio. If I have a patient that is not going to take the vaccine unless it's inhaled, I really try and work with them to get see what our options are there. Um, LIV and IIV are equally effective in adults. Um, we typically give, um, we do not give uh, flu mist or LIV to individuals less than two years of age or 49 years of age. Um, they're pregnant, immunocompromised, history of egg allergy. This goes 
for both vaccines because they both are made with egg protein. Um, one doesn't have more egg protein versus another. They both have egg protein, so it's not what chaps more. And then this is really important since it is a live vaccine. If individuals have taken any uh, antiviral influenza medications in the previous 48 hours, they should not receive this vaccine because that will deactivate the vaccine and not make it effective. Um, precautions for using LIV, um, and it, ha in, it has an increased risk of wheezing. Um, safety with, in persons with underlying conditions are not established. Uh, so, you know, it was not studied in certain groups, but it was studied in HIV individuals. So we can, we have given this to our, when I've worked in my HIV clinic, we have given this as long as I have a good CD4 count. So again, I've done this in different groups, but you have to look at what the indication is and what your patient population is. Um, they don't give a, what we do say for per persons who are um, caregivers for severely immunocompromised, uh, immunosuppressed, they should not, if they're actively caring for that patient, should not receive LIV. We don't have any data, transmission data. Um, or if it's a healthcare worker and you want to receive the LAIV, you should be ref um, avoiding contact with severely immunocompromised individuals. Now, what do I call severely immunocompromised individuals? I call this, you know, bone marrow transplants, liver transplants. These are individuals that are very severely immunocompromised. Now, if I have a grandparent that's on some kind of autoimmune drug like steroids or something like that, that's fine. They can be around that. But I'm talking about um, very suppressed uh, immune systems like bone marrow transplants. Uh, recommendations for persons with egg allergies. Um, most vaccines produ are produced by uh, growing the virus in a chicken egg. Only the flu black, which is the RIV3, is completely egg free. Now the question I do ask, for, especially for my children, um, if they're egg allergic but can eat baked goods, with eggs or lightly cooked eggs and have no reaction, I give the vaccine either the IIV or the uh, LAIV without a problem. Um, if I know that they eat eggs but develop hives, I will give them the vaccine but observe them for reaction for 30 minutes. And when I do this, I have my Benadryl ready with my EpiPen and so forth. If I know that they have um, um, other reactions when either eating eggs, I will make sure I send them to my pulmonologist or my allergist to have them give this vaccine and observe them for 30 minutes. So if they have more of a severe reaction, I'm going to give them to their uh, the allergist. And um, again, I'd love this RIV3 is flu block, um, but I can only give that to individuals 18 years of age, and I don't know if there's any clinical trials. Uh, being marketed for pediatrics. This product's been out for about three years. Another thing to note on this blue block that it's only once you order this, it's, it has a shelf life of about 12 weeks. So it's really, um, it can expire quite quickly compared to other flu vaccines. So buyer beware, order what you need to order. That's why a lot of us just order our routine flu vaccines because we can give them to a, a lot of persons in, universally. So this is an algorithm, again, created by the AAP MMWR um, that goes through what a patient in terms of their egg allergy or reaction is. So it helps, you know, can they eat baked goods, cookies without a problem, administer vaccine as a usual, usual pro protocol. Um, do they, after eating foods, does the parent, patient only experience hives? Yes, you can go ahead um, and if you're giving the typical uh, administer uh, intra inactivated influenza vaccine, it, give it to them um, and watch them for 30 minutes. If you don't know or they have all the symptoms of vomiting, um, wheezing, cardiovascular changes, this is something that should be done by an allergist or their individuals that need to get the flu block or not necessarily receive it if, they, if they're younger than 18. So influenza vaccine production, I always like to talk about this because, you know, as soon as we're starting a flu season, um, our, CD, our, our world counterparts from the World Health Organization and CDC are already looking to see what is circulating. Now, 
um, what is going to be circulating, and they're always thinking about next year about what vaccines they're going to be putting in, what antigens they're going to be putting in the vaccine for next year. So our trivalent has the H1N1 California typical of the 2009 strain, um, H1, uh, uh, excuse me, H3N2 that most resembles the strain that circulated last year that did not match with the vaccine. And then the Yamagata strain of B is going to be in the trivalent vaccine. The quadrivalent is going to have Victoria that's going to cover the, the two Bs associated with influenza. And just to let you know on the Bs, there's only two two strains, it's the Yamagata versus the Victoria. And this really popped up and this was circulating more in the late 80s. So we noticed this more and we noticed our children were having uh, more of this disease. So this is why this came to um, market in April 2012. So quadrivalent formulation addresses again the mismatch for B that I kind of talked about. Currently FDA approved from GSK and Sanofi and no product preferenti uh, um, preferences recommended for any product this year. Um, the choice should be driven by the age indication, contraindications, and precautions, and what you have available. Um, um, there's no preference for quadrivalent versus trivalent, um, no current preference for high doses versus standard, and no current preference for um, inactivated flu uh, influenza vaccine versus LAIV in children or adults. So we're just going to list different kinds of flu vaccines that we're going to talk about here. This is flu cell vax from Novartis, a cellular culture vaccine, um, uh, CC2V3, um, trivalent, uh, grown in cell culture, to not totally egg-free, but functionally egg-free. Um, again, only approved for adults over than 18. Uh, so in pediatrics, I haven't used it yet, and there hasn't been any pediatric trials. Again, flu black, flu black from Protein Sciences, trivalent. This is a totally egg-free process. Uh, similar uh, uh, effects to uh, inactivated uh, influenza, the trivalent type. Um, FDA approved for adults over 18 and six months shelf life. So this is good. This is they've extended it from 12 weeks to 24 weeks. But again, shorter than our typical flu vaccine, which when it's released um, in um. In, in July has a little longer um, shelf life. So just buyer beware on this. Um, I do tell people who work in hospitals and healthcare is, you know, you should get this vaccine if you um, have a total egg allergy, your employer should be uh, um, providing this for you. Other um, inactivated influenza vaccines are the intradermal influenza. Um, it, it's, it comes pre-made in its own um, um, syringe with intradermal in, in, um, insertion, and it's li licensed for adults 18 to 64. And it has similar effects um, associated with uh, vaccine administration of, of inactivated injectable flu vaccine. But in this, it's been reported that erythema at the injection site was the most common. And the reason we don't give it to individuals greater than 64 is that we, at, as we age, we, our skin thins, and we find with people who have thinner skin, intradermal vaccines can be more irritating and cause uh, more effect. Uh, flu zone high dose four times as much antigen. It's indicated for adults higher than six, under over than 65 years of age. Um, but whatever you have in your office is what you should give. Whether you have a 70 year old and you only have inactivated flu vaccine versus high dose, give them what you have um, because it's better than nothing. Um, other available. Um, inactivated flu vaccine, again, is this PharmaJet Stratus free needle. Um, it's pressurized liquid stream, no needle, used with um, a Fluria vaccine, and it's again approved for 18 to 64 year olds. Um, and hopefully, we'll see some pediatric trials coming on later. I was at a, um, a conference this summer, and <clears throat> they are well, moving forward with pediatric trials. This is our table, and you can get this from the CDC, that very quickly lists um, uh, what flu vaccines available. And actually, I've misspoken, the flu fluoria is only actually available for persons nine years of age and older. So, um, but we still will see some pediatric trials on that. Uh, if you have any questions about what they are, um, this is there. And, you know, I've had patients look this 
up because patients will come to clinic and say, I want the preservative free, I don't want any mercury, I don't want any thimerosal or anything like that. So I'll have to pull this chart up and then I will actually pull up the patient insert, uh, the vaccine insert and show them this. And the other thing I also like to bring to my patient's attention if they ask me is that it by it has most of all of these vaccine products have been approved by religious leaders so people who keep halal or kosher or any kind of um, religious diet they have been approved uh, usually been approved by these leaders um, flu mist from metamune LAIV is quadrivalent approved for persons age 2 to 49 we're not giving it to children with active asthma between 2 to 4 years of age uh, and other uh, contraindications and precautions as instructed now as we're getting um, going for flu vaccines um, talking to our par patients or parents or if they call us to say you know I've commonly I'll have people call me and say my mother-in-law is in from Russia, doesn't have insurance, where can I ever get a flu vaccine? And I'll give them this information, fluShot.healthmat.org, the search by address, zip, state, or pharmacy to help them get um, flu vaccines at a more affordable um, um, way through different pharmacies. So vaccinating our high-risk populations. Um, again, reiterating our children, five and under are under risk, especially individuals under two. Persons older than 65 years of age are pregnant women. Um, American Indians and Native Alaskans have um, problems with influenza disease as well, staphylococcus infections and hepatitis B. There is some um, genetic um, issue with um, their immune system that we haven't totally pinpointed, but we do know this ethnic groups do get more severe disease. Residents of uh, nursing homes and long-term care facilities are at risk as well. People at risk for complications. You know, one of the big things we saw with H1N was people with neurologic and neurodevelopmental conditions have significant complications, and I, well, including cerebral palsy. And if they get influenza, we have seen um, them get with uh, even mild to moderate disease can have a reduction of their um, neurologic condition. So if they were functioning at a relatively high level, they get a, a insult with influenza. Um, it's reduced some of their IQ points and their function that they had had had. So I really always focus on everybody, but I always try to find a way in each group that has the chronic illness how I can get them to take the flu vaccine. Uh, and us as providers really have to remember it's a strong recommendation we need to give to them. I walk into the office and say I give it to myself, I'm going to give it to my baby when he's six months of age, and I hope to God everybody around me has it and I'm making sure all of my caregivers and everybody who touches my child has this vaccine. Otherwise, I'm leaving the room and no one can visit until after flu is done. So make a real strong recommendation there. Vaccinating individuals with asthma. Um, you know, again, people who get influenza who have asthma can trigger their asthma attacks, cause further inflammation in their lungs, and lead to pneumonia. And if you've ever seen a patient that has pneumonia, it's not good. If you've ever had anyone that's been admitted and have a necrotizing pneumonia, it's very, very um, stressful, and can, they can be very sick. Um, and it can then lead to second, you know, the, the pneumonias lead to secondary bacteria. Uh, bacterial infections, whether it's a blood infection or an infection of their lung, um, and, and they can be very difficult to treat, and people have died from this. Um, individuals should be in, um, indivi uh, vaccinated with either flu vaccine as long as they can even use flu mist as long as it's appropriate within the contraindications and precautions. And remind that individuals with asthma should receive pneumococcal vaccine as the most likely pneumonia sometimes they're going to get is a pneumococcal pneumonia. And then you should have an asthma action plan and be ready with other equipment as they go into influenza season. Um, Vaccinating children with neurologic uh, disorders need to be vaccinated annually, have higher risk of death and serious complications. Um, most children who died from H1N1 in 2009 uh, had neurologic disorders. And influenza should be treated early and aggressively. If we might think we have someone that has influenza and we're admitted in the hospital, we need to start antivirals right away with either Tamiflu or Relenza. Uh, and the CDC will post more on what what the circulating strain is and what it's sensitive to. So we will have that data pretty quickly once it comes out. 
vaccinating pregnant women early. You know, again, I always like to bring up the 1918 pandemic flu when women who are pregnant at that time got influenza, they had a 50% mortality. Now in 2015, you know, if they get influenza, their mortality and morbidity is 30%. So we've improved somewhat, but still not enough to say that our pregnant women are not at risk. So women can have premature labor and delivery. Um, it's really important that we give this vaccine to them. Vaccination with um, inactivated influenza vaccine is appropriate in any trimester. It passes the protection along to the unborn child. LIV is contraindicated because it's a live vaccine. However, if um, that vaccine is given when the woman does not know she's pregnant, everything will be okay. They looked at the data saying that it did not increase first trimester miscarriages. And it's really important, I can't reiterate this enough, vaccinate close contacts to protect the baby from other exposures. Um, and I can honestly say I'm a first-time parent myself and I, I don't know how I'm going to react with people during the flu season. I know I'm not traveling um, and, you know, uh, I think I want to just keep my child in a bubble. So um, it's very scary to me and I don't want anybody getting my child sick. So let's see if we can help that along. Um, again, pregnant women, strong recommendation from the provider is crucial. It's supported by 11 different uh, organizations. Maternal immune activation may cause deficiency um, in terms of having infection and sepsis may cause uh, deficiency in fetal uh, neurodevelopment or death. Um, postpartum vaccination uh, should happen immediately if it's not been done during pregnancy and breastfeeding is not a contraindication and then breastfeeding passes on maternal antibodies to the infant so it's very important even if you are breastfeeding um, and you, you didn't get flu vaccine before you as a healthy adult it's really important now that you're a parent that you immunize yourself especially if you're breastfeeding to pass the antibody on and then immunize yourself when you're not when you're taking so that you're able to take care of your child uh, if they get sick Healthcare personnel vaccination, my uh, second favorite thing I talked about. Oh, I don't know this. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened there, but um, it, something activated in that uh, old, old slide. Uh, but why do we vaccinate our healthcare personnel? Um, it has a lower risk of them um, acquiring hospital acquired influenza. Outbreaks in hospitals and long care term facilities have attributed to low coverage. We can reduce influenza related illnesses and deaths in these facilities, and we can keep our healthcare workers going to work so they're not getting sick and they're not working sick as well. Um, vaccinating healthcare personnel. Uh, personnel. Um, it, you know, we have many institutions across the Illinois, Chicagoland area that has mandatory uh, vaccination. Um, they've had educational programs and voluntary policies. We know that that's not been effective. The, uh, so it's really making us as healthcare uh, professionals um, accountable. We do know it decreases absenteeism and it does protect our patients. So listed in the gray area here is some institutions that have mandated uh, requiring vaccination for all staff. How effective is the flu vaccine? Every year we're looking at vaccine every product that's submitting their data or has on market they're always looking at their effectiveness of the vaccine in the public health arena. Um, and we typically start doing that as soon as we know how many people have been immunized and who gets influenza that's been in, in, immunized. And then looking at the strain that's circulating, does it match with the strain that's in the vaccine? So you never know until you're in the actual season what is going to be circulating. But we do, according to the CDC, expect a 50 to 60 percent in a non-drifted season. So they should have, they try to try to match the antigens with the what's circulating, whether it's going to drift. A drift is an easy switch where a shift is a major shift in the change and then you'll have burden of disease. So this looks at our vaccine um, effectiveness table. So when we look at this and it goes by different states, um, in terms of our flu seasons, um, we, we have our first one 2004 to 2005, um, you know, 
the overall effectiveness of the flu vaccine for that year was um, uh, 10%, and they had a uh, they didn't list a type of um, the you don't it's an A vaccine that usually is um, circulating, and this is the data that's been um, who's the reference that's um, researched this, but this is on the CDC website that you can look at this every year. So when we look at last year, our overall effectiveness going into 2014 after it was done was 19%. Um, when we look at 2009, um, 56%, and that's you know pretty much where you'd like to be overall. Um, you'd like to get as close as 80% if you can. Um, in 2009, we didn't get our vaccine to market uh, until midst of the circulating uh, disease. So it's always important to know when is vaccine come to market and when can we get it to our population. 2014-2015, um, as I said, we it was the year of the mismatch, 18% um, um, effectiveness for H3N2 strains due to the significant drift, and 45% for the B strains. So last year's flu vaccine resist, uh, reduced a person's risk of having to seek medical care to the doctor's office by only 20%. Still better than nothing, but it's not where we'd like to be. We'd like to reduce that by 80% if we could, or 50. The challenge is some protection is better than none. Vaccination can reduce the severity and length of illness, even when the individual still gets the flu, and then may reduce the spread and unnecessary antibiotic use. I mean, this is really serious. We're having, um, I do infectious disease at University of Chicago Comer Children's Hospital. We are having a shortage of medications that are not being made and or national shortages. So we are running out of antibiotics for people who get secondary infections or multi-drug resistant infections. And it's a problem. And people continuously using more antibiotics could are increasing resistance as well. And then herd immunity, we'd like to increase vaccination so we have herd immunity. And the only way we could do that is really being at above 80% for our vaccination rates. So what can you do? Educate. Teach your patients about the benefits of vaccine and be an immunization champion. I mean, give a strong recommendation. Everybody in your office needs to be doing the same thing. As from the person who checks in the patient, they shouldn't be saying, well, I wouldn't get that flu vaccine, you made me sick. Well, we all know that's not true. The vaccine produced a local systemic response that can make you feel not 100%, but it's in conferring immunity. Advocate for timely and protective vaccinations. Have more flexible evening and hour clinics. Be an example. Immunize yourself, your coworkers, and your loved ones. Uh, make the statement: I immunize my, I immunize my family, my children, um, and I want to, I care about you, so I immunize you. Educate, advocate, and be an example. I want to thank you for your time. Um, and now I'm going to offer this, um, we're going to have some questions, and so I'm going to pull this back to uh, Nersha. Hello, everyone. We're now going to begin our question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Jennifer. Let me see if no problem. Okay. Um, when admi administering a two dose series to a child under eight, can you give the LAIV twice in one season, or would you give the IIV? What if I'm sorry? I'm just going to finish the first question because there's like two additional ones part of it. Um, or would you give the IIV? What if a child had received their first flu vaccine somewhere else um, and it was LAIV? If they needed a second one four weeks later, could I give the IIV? Um, so it doesn't matter which flu product you use to give the second boost. It's just they have to have a second boost so that their body can confer, um, be re you know, reminded to produce better antibodies. So if, the, for example, if the patient got LIV, it's, it, they can get LIV again, but like if they show up at your office and you only have IIV, use what you have to boost them so then they're done the next flu season. Now, obviously, they may have preferred the LIV um, for that. Uh, and so it's just a question that just have to have two 
doses, a booster dose is the same dose that they get um, as with the first dose, and it doesn't matter what product. Sometimes I've had kids that, for example, they show up and they're eight, um, let's say they're 22 months and they get the IIV, I can't give the second dose and be LAIV. It just has to be a two-dose series because we do have that data to show. If they only got one dose, they only responded and produced antibodies about 40 to 50 percent, but when we gave that second dose, they produced um, immune response closer, closer to 80 percent. I think that answers that question. Okay. And um, what are the other flu vaccine concentrations? Um, I'm not exactly sure what that question is. Are they referring to antigen level? Um, and you, if you have that question, you have to go to the each product's um, FDA, um, their, their insert, to look at antigen level. Um, and then the CDC could have something on that. And then if you have patients that are asking about what's the chemicals in that, again, go back to the patient insert. Um, that can give you um, the information. Now, what happens in the, when we first went quadrivalent in 2013-14, and then again, more products went quadrivalent in 2014-15, is when you added an extra antigen, you saw more of an immune response. So people had more erythema associated with that injection. So that's always a risk when we add antigen to vaccine, an additional antigen. And they have to sometimes add additional adjuvants to confer that immunity. Okay. Um, what suggestions do you have to encourage immunization in my patients who refuse vaccination by saying, I never get the flu shot and I never get the flu? I find that these patients are, more, are the most resistant to encouragement. Yeah. Um, you know, there's always that 30% of individuals that resist flu, whether it's a cultural, cultural, racial, or, you know, just this stubbornness. I can't describe that. Um, I, like I said, I have a colleague that we're very good friends, gets every other vaccine except this. Um, and I said to her, I said, you well, know, starting October 15th, you're not going to see my kid. <laughs> so that's one of the things I use. Um, I really use the first-time parents as a very strong kind of way to get them involved. Grandparents saying, are you a grandparent? I always try to find, oh, what's going on in your life? What do you do? Is there anything new? Are you traveling? Um, so I try to use different situations to find out how I can get them to be immunized and be motivating. But it is very difficult. And we have our work cut off for us in about 30% of the patient population. Thank you. That's the stuff I have there. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, any more questions, anyone? We can keep it open for about a minute longer um, to wait for questions. That sounds great. And while we wait, I just wanted to make it clear again, um, after the webinar, you will receive an email with the link to the recording of today's webinar, as well as the PDF of the PowerPoint slides. And if you do, are watching this in a group, please send me emails um, as soon as this webinar is over. And I, my email should be right up on the slide, so please t note that down and um, send those emails over to me. Um, the one thing, Nerja, if... Mm -hmm. I can say is that, like uh, some of the things that we're having and we typically have this with our flu year is that some of our products aren't coming to market as quickly as we'd like them to. So for example, there seems to be a, a flu mist uh, delivery um, uh, delay. Um, and so it's interesting to see different things. And what I tell, do tell people is try to immunize with what you have in your office and trying to have parents not reschedule their appointments based on what product you have. You really do have to give whatever you have in the office because if they wait for a certain product, then they may not get immunized because they'll never get back to the clinic. So it's really important to talk them into that to say, I understand you prefer this product versus this product, but this is what I have right now. And, um, you know, our CDC does look very much um, at um, all vaccine manufacturers to make sure they have 
are keeping up with standards and products. And, and the companies themselves are actually making sure before they come to market, they've maintained the quality that they want to bring to market. So I always remind parents about that. And if they ever have questions about the product, I sit them in the room with the vaccine insert and the VIS so that they can have questions. And those patients I try to schedule either very early or at the late of the end of the day because to have them in a my busy clinic, they take a they take a lot of information that they need to give. So I do work on giving them early or late so I can spend time with them. Cool. Um, I do have one question for you. Um, for healthcare centers that do not require um, immunization of their employees, would you recommend a policy for unvaccinated employees to wear masks with patient contact, like within three feet? You know, the, um, uh, what we do, um, there's different hospitals, and I'd have to look and see what the data um, is from CDC. What hospitals and different centers are doing is that some hospitals can't mandate that you receive the vaccine, right? But they can mandate you report what you did. Um, and so many people report that they gave it, they show proof, or and then people who don't decline, um, it's very important to see what the declination is for. Is it because they think it's going to make them sick, or is it because they think they're allergic, what it is. If they totally de decline based on, you know, philosophical belief, um, most hospitals will um, make sure if they have an illness that they don't work uh, for three to five days. Um, and then the, they're wearing the mask during influenza se uh, season. Some hospitals will actually give stickers that the patients can actually see that you get the sticker saying, I got my flu vaccine for you. And what happens is that then the patients can say, oh, why, what, why don't you have a sticker? So, you know, it's very interesting that it's drawing attention to individuals who aren't wearing, getting flu vaccines. Okay. Um, uh, by the same person, there's two uh, slightly related questions. Until what age do we need to administer two doses? And patients receiving LAIV need two doses too? Yes. Um, so it's um, individuals between ages two to eight, or I say simply anyone under nine, and anybody in their first influenza season needs two influenza vaccines. So if they're two and they parents want them to have flu mist and they're eligible, they get a flu mist at now and then a repeat in two, um, uh, in four weeks. It doesn't matter on product, it's all about boosting. So just like we give our Pediorix at two, four, six months, sometimes we get around with using Pediorix versus Penticel or another thing and it still counts as a boost. So it's different products still count uh, in that regard. So typically we start our infants at six months of age, but sometimes we have a loop through that nobody, this kid doesn't get seen until two years of age and for their flu vaccine and they can be eligible for flu mist. Um, but, you know, we usually start at six months and then they have to get the IIV because that's only what is licensed for that age group. I hope that answers that question. Mm -hmm. And uh, last question. Uh, my ongoing challenge is a population that says that they get the flu from the flu shot. Any suggestions or handouts that might be consumer friendly? Well, you know, I have to always, I always refer people back to um, the CDC and I always, I really like the... I don't know who did this commercial, but it's you see this young couple has this baby and they're driving and they're driving to grandmother's house and grandma turns into the big bad wolf. Um, so that's again in regards to whooping cough, but I, I really believe it's in regards to influenza as well. Um, so it's you know figuring out how to how I don't know of anything really as clever as that for influenza, um, but I always refer people back to CDC and then if. It, you know, I do like working with my drug reps to get different things so that I can put um, office uh, this up in the office. But it, you know, it's working in different centers of having non-branded um, materials in hospitals, and that's why I refer you back to the CDC for their they can have free things that they can send to you. Sounds good. Um, I think that's all for the questions today. Um, thank you, Jennifer Burns. We really appreciated you speaking today. And um, thank you all for joining us on today's webinar. Please join us on our next webinar on December 8th.
at 12 p.m., where we will have Dr. LJ Tan from Immunization Action Coalition discussing updates on influenza, as well as a story from Families Fighting Flu. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us on today's webinar, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you.